Chernobyl nuclear disaster. April 26, 1986, a date etched into history, witnessed a catastrophic event at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant near Pripyat in Soviet Ukraine. During a safety test simulating a power outage, a confluence of reactor design flaws and human actions led to an uncontrolled nuclear reaction in reactor number four. The power surged dramatically, rupturing components and causing steam explosions that obliterated the reactor building. This wasn't a contained incident. A subsequent reactor core fire spewed radioactive contaminants across the Soviet Union and Europe. The immediate toll was grim. Two workers perished in the explosion, and within three months, 28 more succumbed to acute radiation sickness. Over the following years, while direct radiation-linked fatalities remained relatively contained according to some estimates, the long-term health consequences, particularly the rise in childhood thyroid cancer, became a significant concern. The response to this unprecedented crisis was immense, involving over half a million personnel and an estimated $84.5 billion in today's dollars. Some analysis pegged the total financial impact at a staggering $700 billion, making it the costliest disaster in human history. In the chaotic aftermath, a 6.2-mile exclusion zone was swiftly established, eventually expanding to 19 miles, leading to the permanent evacuation of approximately 117,000 people. The abandoned city of Pripyat became a haunting symbol of the disaster's reach, later replaced by the purpose-built city of Slavutich for the displaced. To contain the ongoing radioactive threat, the hastily constructed Chernobyl nuclear power plant sarcophagus was erected around the destroyed reactor in December 1986. Recognizing its limitations, a massive $2.3 billion new safe confinement structure was built between 2010 and 2016 to facilitate the eventual removal of the reactor debris, a cleanup effort projected to continue until 2065. The Chernobyl disaster stands as a profound lesson in the critical importance of nuclear safety protocols and the enduring consequences of such technological failures. Three Mile Island Nuclear Accident It was just after 4 a.m. on March 28, 1979, when things quietly started going wrong at the Three Mile Island Nuclear Power Plant in Pennsylvania. No explosion, no dramatic fireballs, just a subtle chain reaction that would end up redefining how America looked at nuclear energy. It started with a blocked filter, routine stuff, but that small clog sent a little bit of water into the wrong place, a control airline, and hours later, it triggered the shutdown of a critical cooling system. Without the feed water pumps running, the reactor core didn't just get hot. It got angry. Pressure shot up. A relief valve opened to cool things down, but then it didn't close. The system started hemorrhaging coolant. And the worst part? The instruments told the crew everything was fine. They followed their training, and their training failed them. One light blinked, telling them the valve was shut. It wasn't. As water escaped, a massive steam bubble formed inside the reactor, completely invisible to the operators. They thought the core was overfilling, so they actually turned off the emergency cooling pumps, the very systems that could have saved them. By the time the radiation alarms went off, it was already too late. Half the uranium core had melted. Nearly 32,000 gallons of radioactive coolant had leaked. And then came the panic. Conflicting information from officials, a hesitant evacuation order, first five miles, then 20. Over 140,000 people fled their homes in fear. The Kemeny Commission ripped into the plant's training protocols, design flaws, and regulatory oversight. The damage wasn't just physical, it was psychological. Cleanup took 14 years and cost about $1 billion back then, closer to $2 billion now. But the real price? Public trust. The US nuclear industry never fully recovered. Windscale Fire Nuclear Disaster October 10, 1957 started out like any other day on England's northwest coast until a fire broke out inside pile number one at the Windscale Nuclear Facility. What began as an internal issue in one of Britain's post-war reactors quickly spiraled into the country's worst nuclear disaster. The fire burned for three straight days, silently releasing radioactive materials into the sky. Winds carried the contamination far beyond the facility, across the United Kingdom and deep into Europe. One of the biggest threats was iodine-131, a radioactive isotope known for attacking the thyroid. Even more disturbing, later studies confirmed that plutonium-210 had also been released, an element so toxic it was used decades later to assassinate Alexander Litvinenko in London. There were no sirens, no evacuations. People kept going about their lives as though nothing had happened. Behind the scenes, though, scientists and government officials scrambled. Milk from nearby farms, spread across 190 square mile zone, was found to be contaminated. For a month, authorities quietly ordered it diluted and destroyed, never fully disclosing the danger to the public. 
Analysts believe that exposure from the fire and earlier radioactive leaks could be linked to between 100 and 240 additional cancer deaths. The most chilling part? The British government tried to bury it. Reports were censored. Prime Minister Harold Macmillan allegedly worried that coming clean about the incident would jeopardize nuclear cooperation with the United States. And Windskill's problems didn't begin with the fire. Earlier that same year, strontium-90, a dangerous isotope linked to bone cancer, had already leaked, quietly contaminating the area. Later investigations revealed that much of the radioactive fallout blamed on the fire actually came from those earlier releases. What the public was told barely scratched the surface. The truth was far more radioactive. Kushdim Nuclear Disaster In 1957, deep in the Soviet Union, something exploded. Not a bomb, but a tank filled with liquid nuclear waste. It happened in a secret city called Chelyabinsk 40, which didn't even exist on maps. People nearby didn't know they were living next to a ticking time bomb. At 4.22 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon, a poorly maintained tank buried 27 feet underground blew up with the force of 70 tons of TNT. A 160-ton concrete lid was hurled into the air like it weighed nothing. A column of glowing radioactive dust shot nearly a mile high, then floated down over villages, farms, and rivers. The Soviet government didn't warn anyone. Workers unknowingly carried radioactive dust into the nearby city of Azyorsk, on their clothes, on their shoes, even on the tires of their buses. Entire city blocks lit up with radiation spikes, especially Lenin Street, where the plant bosses lived. They started hosing off shoes and blocking traffic from the plant. But it was already too late. A radioactive cloud drifted northeast for hundreds of miles. Over 20,000 square miles were contaminated, affecting nearly 270,000 people. The cause? A failed cooling system. They knew the tank was overheating. They just didn't fix it. And when it blew, the Soviet leadership blamed it on a couple of plant engineers instead of the sloppy, rushed system that was never designed with safety in mind. No sirens, no public announcements. People in 22 villages were eventually evacuated, but some waited two years for that order. They dumped radioactive waste into rivers people drank from and into Lake Karache, a toxic puddle that later earned the title Most Polluted Place on Earth. For decades, this level 6 nuclear disaster, the second worst after Chernobyl, was hidden from the world. Even U.S. scientists didn't catch wind of it until the 1980s. Fukushima Nuclear Disaster March 11, 2011 Started off like any other quiet morning in Fukushima. People went about their daily routines, unaware that in just minutes, life as they knew it would unravel. A 9.0 magnitude earthquake hit offshore, one of the most powerful ever recorded in Japan. That alone was terrifying. But then came the tsunami, a wall of water, rising up to 46 feet high, surged toward the coast and smashed right into the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. The plant's seawall stood at just 33 feet. That wasn't enough. The earthquake had already triggered an automatic shutdown of the reactors, but when the tsunami flooded the facility, it knocked out the backup power. That backup was the last line of defense. Emergency generators meant to keep the reactors cool. Without it, the fuel rod started overheating fast. Hydrogen gas built up inside the reactors and, one after another, Units 1, 3, and 4 exploded. These weren't small blasts either. They tore the buildings apart and sent radioactive materials spilling into the air and the sea. What followed was chaos. Over 164,000 people had to evacuate. Families were uprooted, sometimes more than once, as the danger zones kept expanding. Radiation exposure didn't cause immediate health crises. But the psychological impact, living in fear of an invisible threat, was devastating. At least 51 deaths were linked to the stress and disruption caused by evacuation alone. The financial hit was staggering. Cleanup and compensation are expected to cost around $180 billion. Investigations exposed a damning truth. Safety protocols were weak, risk assessments were outdated, and evacuation plans were a mess. Today, debates still rage about the release of treated radioactive water igniting anger in nearby countries. Fukushima wasn't just a disaster, it was a wake-up call, and the world is still feeling the aftershocks. Church Rock July 16, 1979 marks a dark chapter in U.S. environmental history. At United Nuclear Corporation's uranium mill in Church Rock, New Mexico, a tailings disposal pond failed catastrophically. This wasn't a small leak. It was a major breach that unleashed over 1,100 short tons of solid radioactive mill waste and a staggering 94 million U.S. gallons of acidic radioactive tailing solution into the Pierco River. To put it into perspective, this single event released more radioactivity than the infamous Three Mile Island accident that occurred just four months prior. The consequences were far-reaching. 
an estimated 1.36 short tons of uranium and 46 curies of alpha contaminants flowed downstream for 80 miles, contaminating the Porco River and eventually reaching the Navajo Nation in Arizona. This toxic deluge wasn't just radioactive, it was also highly acidic and laced with dangerous metals and sulfates. The Navajo people, who relied on the river for drinking water, irrigation, and livestock, were left vulnerable and, tragically, weren't adequately warned of the danger for days. Adding insult to injury, the governor of New Mexico refused to declare the site a federal disaster area, limiting the aid available to the affected communities. The environmental catastrophe, impacting a predominantly Native American population in a rural area, received significantly less media attention than Three Mile Island. Years later, the EPA listed the Church Rock tailing storage site on its national priority list, noting that the groundwater contamination remained uncontrolled. A $525,000 out-of-court settlement with the Navajo Nation a year after the spill did little to address the long-term environmental health impacts that continue to affect the region to this day. The Church Rock uranium mill spill stands as a stark reminder of the potential for devastating environmental injustice and the enduring legacy of radioactive contamination. Tokai Mura Criticality Accident In 1999, a quiet Japanese town became the epicenter of one of the most disturbing nuclear accidents in modern history. At a small plant in Tokai Mura, operated by GCO, a company not even involved in mainstream power generation, three unsuspecting workers triggered a nuclear chain reaction that ran for nearly 20 hours. The cause? A lethal mix of ignorance, human error, and an astonishing disregard for safety protocols. Instead of following approved procedures, workers had been dumping uranium solution straight into the precipitation tank, completely bypassing a critical control step. The tank's shape, size, and the sheer amount of uranium, around 35 pounds enriched to 18.8% U-235, created a deadly cocktail. Around 10.35 am, the solution reached critical mass. The reaction kicked off immediately. No fireball, no mushroom cloud, just a quiet, invisible burst of neutron and gamma radiation that spread through the facility. Two workers would later die excruciatingly slow deaths, one after 12 weeks, the other after 7 months. Their bodies had absorbed between 6,000 and 20,000 milligrays, enough to guarantee acute radiation syndrome and a horrifying demise. A total of 119 people were exposed to radiation, and over 160 residents were evacuated. The entire neighborhood within 0.2 miles of the site was cleared out just five hours into the crisis. Shockingly, GCO had altered the procedures three years prior without telling the regulators. The modifications made the process faster, but also far more dangerous. Training for the staff was nearly non-existent. And oversight? The regulatory body only inspected the facility twice a year and never while it was operational. Cleanup and compensation weren't cheap. Japan's nuclear insurance paid out up to $9.4 million, but GCO and its parent company were left to cover an additional $121 million. In the end, the government revoked the plant's license, but for those who suffered, the justice came far too late. SL1 In the desolate landscape near Idaho Falls, Idaho, January 1961, witnessed a terrifying event at the SL1 nuclear reactor. What started as a routine maintenance task ended in a violent explosion claiming the lives of three engineering technicians. Their duty involved a seemingly simple procedure, reattaching the control rods to their drive mechanism. In a fateful half-second, one of the technicians lifted the central control rod a mere 20 inches. This action proved catastrophic. Within a blink of an eye, just 4 milliseconds, the reactor spiraled into a supercritical state. Its power surged to an unimaginable 20,000 megawatts, over 6,000 times its normal operating capacity. The immense heat generated by this sudden power surge instantly vaporized the water within the reactor. The resulting high-pressure steam hammered against the top of the reactor vessel, lifting the entire 9-foot structure off the ground. One of the control rods was even found embedded in the ceiling of the reactor building, a stark testament to the force of the blast. The SL-1 reactor's purpose was quite specific, to provide heat and electricity for remote DEW line radar sites, part of the nation's early warning system against potential Soviet attacks. This mission dictated a unique design, small, lightweight, easily maintained, and capable of running for three years without refueling. To achieve this, the boiling water reactor incorporated cutting-edge technologies, including highly enriched uranium fuel and only five control rods to simplify upkeep. However, this rush toward innovation led to inadequately tested systems, plagued by operational hiccups like control rod stickiness. 
It's believed this very stickiness prompted the technicians to attempt a manual rod travel exercise, the action that ultimately triggered the fatal surge. This tragedy underscores a crucial lesson. While the allure of new technology can be strong, premature deployment can lead to devastating failures. A robust evaluation process is vital to ensure technology is truly ready for critical applications. Davis Bessie Reactor In March 2002, at the Davis Bessie Nuclear Power Station in Ohio, what was supposed to be a routine refueling turned into one of the most alarming discoveries in U.S. nuclear history. Workers found that boric acid, quietly leaking for who knows how long, had eaten through nearly six inches of the reactor's pressure vessel head, leaving behind just a fragile layer of stainless steel only three-eighths of an inch thick. That thin shield was the only thing standing between the highly pressurized reactor core and a major loss of coolant accident. Had it failed, emergency systems would have scrambled to take over, but the consequences could have spiraled out of control. And this wasn't a one-time scare. Eight years later, in 2010, new cracks showed up, this time in the control rod drive mechanism nozzles. Once again, the plant had come dangerously close to disaster. Fortunately, both incidents were caught just in time thanks to inspections pushed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. But what really shocked investigators was how avoidable it all was. Warning signs had been there. Clogged filters, boric acid buildup, overlooked operational red flags, but nobody acted. In response, the NRC launched a full investigation and concluded that both the plant's operators and the commission itself had dropped the ball. They implemented sweeping changes from stricter inspections to systems designed to actually learn from past failures. Davis Bessie became a cautionary tale burned into the memory of the nuclear industry. And the financial fallout was just as serious. First Energy Nuclear Operating Company paid out $28 million in penalties, restitutions, and community service under a deferred prosecution deal. On top of that, they were hit with $5.45 million in civil penalties. The message was clear. When it comes to nuclear safety, negligence doesn't just cost money. It risks everything.